Hey, Thomas, how's it going? Good, how are you? Yeah, good. Before we begin then, a huge thank you for coming on. And for people who are not familiar with Skinwalker Ranch, could we just go over some of the basics of, of what it is? Absolutely. We'll go wherever you'd like to go. All right. So what is Skinwalker Ranch? Uh, so Skinwalker Ranch is uh, the most paranormal studied hotspot in the world. Um, it, it's uh, a place that sits in the middle of uh, the Ute Tribal Reservation uh, here in Utah. And uh, the, the source of many unexplained phenomena. And, and uh, it's got a history of all kinds of, of strange occurrences happening here. So how far does that history go back? When did it first come to prominence as this hotspot? That's a fantastic question. Um, part of our work uh, since Brandon Fugel acquired and purchased the ranch back in 2016 has been to try to piece together the history of, of the place. And, um, you know, in talking with the, with the local natives, uh, the, the tribal members that are here, as well as... Uh, going through the histories of, of individuals that have been in the area, you know, we, we have some pretty astounding reports of, of occurrences happening clear back in the 1930s. And then if you take in, you know, the Native American um, uh, history, the, the, the stories that they tell, uh, there's been strange, unexplained things happening in this area for a long time, uh, dating back, you know, maybe even more than 100 years. So... The early strange, unexplained things, how would you categorize them? Were they UFOs, um, ghosts? Um, what what stories did you come across? Um, cattle mutilations um, and, and UFOs, um, tales of, you know, the sky gods uh, coming down. Uh, if, you're, if you're going and talking to, um, you know, natives that are talking – a long, long time ago, but if we're talking about the 30s up through the you know 60s, 70s, we're we're talking about cattle mutilations, UFOs. Um, there's a story that took that we were told by one of the uh, relatives of of the Locke family, which homesteaded here uh, clear back in the early 1900s. They told a story of a someone, a gentleman knocking on the door and um, and leaving the house afterwards, and then the, the kids ran out to follow him and the tracks just like vaporized, disappeared, uh, you know, things like of that nature. And what got you intrigued in Skinwalker Ranch in the very beginning? Uh, well, truth be told, I wasn't intrigued by Skinwalker Ranch in the very beginning. Um, when Brandon Fugel purchased the ranch back in 2016, uh, he sent a close confidant out here to the ranch to Try to figure out what it was that he had just purchased and acquired. And uh, Brandon at the time didn't want anybody to know that he had bought the ranch. He's a very successful real estate, uh, commercial real estate broker. And he was afraid that if, if people found out that he was the owner of the ranch, that it might stigmatize and hurt his business. So he was adamant that nobody know that he, he was the owner. And so he'd sent uh, this confidant, uh, Jim Morse, and for those that have watched our TV series on uh, the, the Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, or I think over there it's uh, The Curse of Skinwalker Ranch. Mm -hmm. But um, for those that have watched the series, they'll know Jim Morse is, is part of that. And uh, Jim came into town uh, here in Roosevelt. And at the time, my wife and I owned a small luxury uh, hotel here in, in town. And Jim ended up staying with us. And we struck up a conversation as he was uh, getting ready to check out the following day. And he found out that I was a licensed general contractor and uh, asked me if I would come out here and do a property inspection. And so for me, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've, I've started a lot of businesses. Um, I'm a businessman at heart. And so for me, the lure of coming out here was really the opportunity to be able to rub shoulders and get to know these two great business titans had nothing to do with the ranch itself. And, and to be honest, when I came out here, I, I didn't really uh, believe in the paranormal. Uh, my reasons for coming out here were purely selfish and, and had to do with business relationships. And so to 
I, I guess that when I really became intrigued with the ranch itself was, uh, you know, after I'd been here and started to have experiences and witnessing things that I just couldn't easily explain away. Uh, that's when it, that's kind of when it got its hooks into me and, and started to intrigue me. Oh, that's fascinating then that you were a skeptic. So you go out there, you've got this, um, you know, you've got these two guys and then you, you've got your business motivation. What was the first thing that kind of made you think, hold on a minute, something's not quite right here. Well, so, so here's the fascinating thing because I was skeptical because I didn't buy into it. Um, uh, when things started happening, I would explain them away. And I'll give you an example. The very first day that, that I come into the ranch uh, with Jim Morse to come do the property inspection that he'd asked me to do, we were in the caretaker's house, which is right here. We call it Homestead One. Uh, we, you got the, the, the old ranch house that the Shermans lived in that's the site of so many strange and bizarre uh, stories. But there, there was an elderly couple living in there at the time the, the we call them the caretakers. And we rolled in. And so I'm doing the inspection on the property. We go in the house. We visit with them for a few minutes. And as I'm walking through this house, we get into the back bedroom there on the southeast corner. And we're just standing there talking to each other when all of a sudden I started to get experience vertigo. And the room felt like it started to spin. And I got so dizzy that I actually backed up against the wall and then I slid down the wall to where I was sitting on the floor. Now, at the time, you know, I'm, I'm borderline hypoglycemic. If my blood sugar gets low, I experience, I can get a little bit lightheaded, you know, maybe dizzy. Um, and so at, in the moment, that's what I explained it away as I'm like, oh, I must have. But the interesting thing is, is Jim and I had come straight from the Ute Plaza Grill. So we just had lunch. Uh and, and I, I don't put all these facts together in the moment, right? So it's happening and I'm just like, oh, I must have low blood sugar. The, the interesting thing is, is that that spinning sensation where I felt the room was spinning, it lasted, you know, not very long, probably less than 60 seconds. And then I started to regain my composure and stood back up and we went on our way and I didn't give it much thought. But the interesting thing is, is that my whole life, yeah, I've had many times where my blood sugar's gotten low. I've experienced dizzy. But only one time, well, twice, and they've both been here on the ranch, have I ever had that spinning sensation. It's never happened anywhere else. And it's never, um, it's, I, I've never experienced that same thing. And then when I start thinking about it, I'm like, well, I just eaten 30 minutes earlier. So it wasn't blood, low blood sugar. And so in the moment, there are a lot of things like that that started to happen to me where I just explained it away. And uh, the, the problem is, is that uh, once you can, you know, one time you can explain away as a coincidence, twice, three times, by the time you get to 20, 30, 40 times, you look like a bigger fool trying to explain it away than you do just finally accepting the fact that, you know what, there's something strange happening here that, that I don't know what it is. And so that, that took a while. I, I, I must say, I've probably been on the ranch for about a year before I was, I'll just say, compelled, forced to accept the fact that the ranch was a place where unexplained activity was taking place. So I was slow to the party and I refused to believe that until I was absolutely forced to. All right, we'll get to the party in a minute then. So what were the other things that happened that you explained away? Well, um, so that was April when Jim first brought me, April of 2016. I came on about a week after Brandon purchased the ranch. And uh, and so roll fast forward a couple months, we're probably, I mean, it was a warm night. So we're probably like June, July. Um, and I get a call from the caretakers and they're, the, the poor lady was just terrified. She's like, Tom, somebody is out front throwing the basketball against the front of the house. And, uh, and I, and I was like, okay, uh, you know, stay put, I'll be right there. And so I jumped in the car and I burned out here, made it out here pretty quick. It's about a 15 minute drive from my house. I think I made it probably 10 or 11 minutes. And, uh, I got here, 
they were inside just terrified. Um, and the first thing I noticed when I rolled in was the basketball was literally laying right in front of the, like out in the yard in front of the house. And Jim Morse and I had been here earlier in the day. We, we had left probably like five or 6 PM earlier that evening. And I had noticed that the basketball was sitting in the planter right by the front door. So when I pull up, I see the basketball sit in the front yard. And the first thing in my mind is we've got some high school punks out here, just, you know, causing problems just out for a laugh. So I grabbed uh, so the equipment we out here. We had a brand new set of white phosphorus night vision goggles. Brandon just purchased like a $35,000 dollars $40,000 infrared uh, camera. And I grabbed that equipment. It's pitch black outside. This is probably 1230 at night. And I do a full sweep of the property around Homestead 1. And I didn't find any traces of anybody. I didn't see any footprints prints in the dirt or anything to indicate that someone had been there. And the road leading into the ranch is, is very, very straight. And it's, it's straight for about maybe close to a mile. And so my thought was, is, well, as soon as I got on that road coming into the ranch, my headlights, they probably saw my headlights bouncing along as I was coming. And they probably, I probably scared them towards the West. So I got in the car I have this really bright spotlight in one hand, the windows down. I'm, I'm in my Yukon and, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, and, uh, and so I'm rolling around down the road towards the West and my windows down. I've got the, the one hands like out the window, holding the spotlight, the other hands holding the shotgun out the window. And I'm kind of driving the car with my knees, just creeping along the ranch towards the West. And as I get over to a place, we now know it as a triangle. Uh, it's 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 one of the hottest. It's a hot spot here on the ranch for strange activity. It's definitely got our attention. We spent a lot of time researching there, but at the time, none of us knew that there was anything special about this place. And it, and you roll over the the culvert and across the canal, and you come, drop down into the triangle. And uh, as I drop down in the triangle, I hear this male voice that said, stop, don't go any further. Now, strangely enough, maybe this might freak a lot of people out, but to me, I didn't really give it a second thought because, you know, I was raised very religious, um, you know, Christian, and you've got the Holy Ghost, the, the still small voice that can warn you and guide you. And, and so like, it was part of my programming, right? That, that, and I don't know why, but it didn't, alarm me. It didn't really set off any warning bells. It was just, I stopped the car and I got out and like being the good Christian I was, I started yelling obscenities up into the rocks and, and, you know, fired my shotgun up. I started shooting the gun up towards the rocks thinking that I was going to scare these punks yeah. out from whatever rock they were hiding from. Um, but nobody jumped up out of there. No, I didn't, nobody ran. And so at this point I'm like, Okay, I'm certain that nobody's around the ranch house. And if there is anybody over here, they know I'm, you know, they know I'm out here shooting the gun off. I'm sure they're gone. And I didn't think anything of it. I came back over, talked to the caretakers, you know, told them, I said, I'm, I'm confident nobody's around. You're safe. If they come back, call me, you know, uh, get security. Um, and, and so that was, you know, that's a time when I hear an audible voice. And then you go from that summer and fast forward into winter, we're probably, I need to go back and see if I have it in my records, but it's probably January, February um, of, of 2017. And so we're, we're about six months later and we just had a really big snowstorm. And so, you know, this wasn't my full-time job. This was something I was doing around my full-time job. I, I got done with my job. And I thought I need to go plow the road out uh, because because we had elderly caretakers out here. I always felt it was important to make sure the roads were cleared. We could get emergency medical services in here if we needed to. And so I came out to the ranch. I, I had a, a skid steer with a snow plow on the front of it. And I, I hauled it out. I, I had it at my hotel. I'd been plowing the parking lot and I got done there. And I, I hauled it out here to the ranch with my truck and trailer. And I parked out on the eastern edge of the property out by the turnaround. This is as far as the public can go. 
and it's about a half a mile from the command center. And it, it snowed, it snowed a lot, maybe about a foot, because the bottom of the gate was was pushing the snow as it opened. And so it took me several passes to to plow the road out. And uh, I had my my machine makes a lot of noise. Obviously, it's a, it's you know it's a piece of heavy equipment, and then the snow plow rumbling on the ground. And I had earbuds in my ears listening to an audio book. But it's 11.30 at night when I started. I, it's probably about 1 a.m. and I got the road plowed out. I got all of the parking lot around the command center plowed out. And I was still wide awake. And it was just really peaceful that night. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and just finish plowing the rest of the road, clear out to the west side. Um, and so I start plowing and I drop down off the canal into the space that we now call the triangle. And still at this point in history, there was nothing that had been put on a radar about the triangle to make it special, but it was the exact spot that I'd heard this voice earlier. And I'm, I'm plowing lost in my thoughts, lost in my audio book. When all of a sudden I hear this male voice, this audible male voice say, stop, don't go any further. And once again, I'm not alarmed. I just spin around. I start making my second pass. I come all the way back to the command center. I turn around. I'm making my third pass back over there. Now I'm thinking about this voice. I'm like, you, you know, before, if you told me that it was an audible voice, or I would have just told you it was an audible voice. It sounded like somebody was speaking and I was hearing it with my ears. But this night, the machine, the snow plow, the earbuds in, you could have been standing two feet away from me and yelled, and I probably wouldn't have been able to make out what you said. And yet here's this very clear audible warning and I'm thinking about this and analyzing it as I'm heading back over there. And I, I told myself that I had made it up and, you know, it's all in my head. You can make yourself believe anything you want. You, you know, people can get themselves freaked out. And so when I got over to that spot that I got in the warning, I just kept driving. I was like, you know, I'm not going to be a wimp. I'm just this is stupid. And I kept driving. And I plowed maybe another 150, 200 feet further towards the west when all of a sudden I started to experience a, you know, I say it's like a neurological, a physiological effect where I started to shake, uh, get back from the camera a little bit. I started shaking so bad I could barely control my machine. And, you know, the skid steer operates with two joysticks you know, and, and it required both of them to go forward. And I'm shaking so bad. I can barely, barely operate the machine. I turn around and I'm in such a state now of terror. I'm not thinking rationally. I'm not thinking logically. Like all I can think is getting out of there. And I felt like something was going to grab me, eat me. Like, I don't, I was just completely terrified. And I, I drove that machine, which is not very fast at all and made my getaway. I drove clear out to the edge where my truck and trailer were parked. And at this point, I am so terrified and shaking so bad that that uh, when I hit the trailer to you know load the machine, I was going so fast, I almost overshot the machine off the trailer. And I, I didn't turn the machine off. I threw the safety bar up. I bailed out of it. The chains uh, that bind it down were still, they were uh, attached to the trailer, but I didn't, you know, they're just hanging off the side. My ramps are back there. I jumped in the truck and gunned it. My ramps are back there flying around. The chains are sparking all over the place. Machine still turned on and running on top of the trailer. <laughs> and I, I didn't even care. I just, I wasn't even in my right state of mind. I made it all the way out to the main highway, turned north and started heading in Fort Duchesne before I felt safe enough to stop. I jumped out through the gate, uh, ramps up on the trailer, threw the chains on, turned the machine off. I didn't chain it down, which I should have. Um, I just got back in the truck and I burned it for home. And I got home and ran in and into my bed and jumped in bed. And I was I was sitting there shaking so bad. My wife was like, "What is going on with you?" And I couldn't I couldn't even answer because I was so uh, you know my almost like when. Uh, you know, I've gotten shocked severely electrically several times and your muscles tense up to where you can't control it. It was very similar to that, almost, a, you know, electrical response to the muscles. But um, I continued to shake 
really, really bad until it, it started to wear off the following day later in the afternoon. So, you know, we're talking at more than a 12 hour period of time that, that I, I had uncontrollable shaking. I don't know what that was, but um, that really got my attention. And so these things started to pile up like that. I mean, that's, that's January, February of 2017. Then I had a, a very severe head injury, March of 2017. So this had been a month or two later, six, eight weeks later, I, I had a severe head injury that put me in the hospital, almost cost me my life. Um, it, and that's, it was really at the time that I had that head injury that I finally gave in and started to say, you know, maybe this place, maybe this place is dangerous. Maybe there is something to this. All right. Before the head injury, then going back to how you described it, was it almost like you were in the throes of some kind of electromagnetic force field or something that you had to get out of? You know, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I do believe that there was some type of energetic, you know, maybe electromagnetic, something was causing a physiological effect. Um, it, it, uh, it was uncontrollable and it was, there was nothing I could, it felt like I was powerless against it. And, and so, you know, that's definitely one possibility that, that I seriously entertain as, as, you know, it, probable and has there been any readings of abnormal electromagnetic um stuff out there <laughs> that that tends to be uh probably one of the things that that we look at the most matter of fact our our principal investigator and chief scientist eric bard uh you know if you go back to episode one on television and you know, they dramatize it to no end, but uh, it's television, you know, what do you do? But, you know, when Eric says that he has a possible, um, you know, an idea of what could be causing it and, and they're like, you know, Brand is like, Eric, show them what's in the case. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, what is it? And they open it up and it's just a large magnet, right? And everybody's like, a magnet? What are you talking about? But the thing is, is that, uh, you know, so much of what we've seen out here, Eric, Eric had an inclination that, that the electromagnetic uh, field out here might be, might be responsible for some of the things we're seeing. And uh, he's actually been able to, the reason he brought that magnet out was that he's been able with that magnet to reproduce some of the things that we've seen. Uh, we've all, I, I think all of the team members have had problems with their own personal cell phones, electronics and stuff. And Eric has been able to set that up and reproduce it using that large, powerful uh, magnet. And so, and, and you know, uh, a strong force like that can definitely have effects on, you know, your physiology, your, your body. And so, um, but we've seen enough with our electronics and with measurements and our meters and everything to, to say that, yes, we are seeing some very uh, interesting electromagnetic uh anomalies out here so thomas how did the near fatal injury come about it's a good question um and and in all honesty it's it's something you know i i started exhibiting symptoms on my birthday which is march 4th it happened to be a saturday that year and uh we had been at a funeral all day i hadn't even been on the ranch and uh and it started out that uh, it just started with a, with a really tender spot on the back of my head back here. And, um, and then grew into the next morning when I woke up, it had grown into a very, very tight goose egg that was, you know, it, it was extremely sensitive and, and very painful. And I just thought it was a spider bite or an insect bite. I didn't give much thought to it. Um, there's a lot of things that transpired with that injury. And, and, uh, you know, I ended up Tuesday morning, my wife forced me to go to the hospital. And at that point it had spread so badly, um, that by Wednesday, our doctor was telling her to call the family in and prepare them. She said, it didn't look like I was going to pull through. 
And if I did, I'd be in a vegetative state. And there's a lot of things surrounding that. Um, because of my position here on the ranch, it, it brought about an investigation that followed. And, and to be honest, I haven't talked publicly about those things. I, <laughs> uh, I don't know if people would even believe me if I did, to be honest with you. Um, just a lot of, it's, it's really what turned my world upside down, pulled the rug out from under me. Um, that forced me to start living with the fact that there's things that happen. We don't understand everything on this planet. There's a lot of things that, that we don't understand. And um, so I haven't talked publicly about the cause or any of that. Um, you know, I, I will say I have, I have on Twitter, um, you know, the, there's been some things said to me or said about me by uh, Dr. Um, I think it's Gary Nolan, um, Stanford professor and the Havana syndrome, I follow those things closely. And when people ask, I'd usually just point them in that direction and say, go, go read what the experts have said. And I just leave it at that. Yeah. I mean, without talking about a cause then, just in general terms, was a definitive cause identified or could you only speculate as to a range of possible causes? <clears throat> well, because we didn't, uh, I, I think that you're going to have to say that it's all speculation. You know, we've got some, we do have some good ideas based on um, the the investigation. I mean, I've done so many lab, I've gone to the lab so many times, done so many different tests. Uh, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. I mean, more than four or five dozen different unique tests at the lab. I've, I've had more MRIs and CAT scans that I can even remember um, and based on those things, uh, they've been able to come to a pretty good, like they're pretty confident in their conclusion that, that, you know, I was hit with some microwaves. Um, but beyond that, I, I mean, even then that's, that's what they think happened. But at the end of the day, there's no hard evidence to say this is exactly what happened. So how did that brush with death? affect your worldview oh it it uh changed it completely i mean uh it i i would say that 2017 was kind of a dark year for me um it's i woke up suddenly and the world was a different place then and it wasn't just instantaneous um look when i went to the hospital I, I still was under the impression that I was suffering from an insect bite, that maybe I'd gotten bit by a black widow. We have lots of black widows around here. And I just figured, you know, I was having a bad reaction to maybe I got bit by a poisonous spider. Um, it wasn't until, you know, I'm in the hospital for, for, uh, for that week. And while I was there, I think did 42 or 43 different tests, blood tests, uh, they drew the fluid out of my head and then test on that. Um, they had tested for everything that they could think of. And the doctor remember him coming in and he'd shake his head every time. He's like, you're the healthiest sick person I've ever treated. Um, my labs came back spot on perfect. Everything was not just good, but like phenomenal. And um, he, we were able, they were able to rule out a hundred percent. It wasn't an insect bite. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, there was a lot of things they were able to rule out hundred percent that it wasn't. And as those things start getting crossed off the list, my explanations start growing. My, my concerns start growing. And then when, when you, you know, they start taking the things that in my mind, I've talked myself into like, oh yeah, it's an insect bite. And then they're like, oh, it's not an insect bite. And I'd argue, I'd be like, well, maybe it's, you know, maybe you just, and he's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. We just ran this test, this test to this test. We know for sure it has, there's absolutely no venom or poison in your body. Okay. So now that that's been taken away from me, my mind starts thinking, well, okay, what else caused it? And truth be told, when I got to, when I uh, was released from the hospital, my, my discharge papers literally said, um, we don't know what causes, like we don't, my diagnosis was undetermined. Um, and so 
gradually, you know, and I'd been home a couple of days when then I was contacted and asked if I would cooperate in an investigation and I agreed. And, and as that investigation started to unfold and things started to happen there piece by piece, I started becoming more and more disturbed by what was being revealed by what was being, you know, both, both the things that were being eliminated as well as the possibilities that were being introduced. And, and it just kind of was like this slow, gradual uh, decline. And by the time September, October rolled around of 2017, I was in a pretty dark place and the world wasn't looking so uh, fantastic anymore. And so it took me a while to come to grips with the fact that uh, the world was not the place that I had grown up thinking it was. And um, it's, it, it's, it turned me upside down. There's no other way to say it. So while you're in that dark place, were you rethinking your occupation and contemplating relocation out of that area? No, because the dark place I was in wasn't limited to the ranch. You know, there's places where you just realize you can't run fast enough. You can't hide good enough. You can't escape. You can't like you, you know, there is no running. That's when you come to terms with your mortality and realize that, uh, you know, you, you, you enjoy. And, and that's really where the clouds broke for me is, you know, as it rolled into 2018, just coming to terms with the fact that maybe, maybe there's a lot I can't control and maybe my days are limited. And so you just make the best out of every single day that you get. And, and, and to be honest, in a lot of ways, it was a gift because, you know, I'm happier than I've ever been, and I'm just appreciative for every day that I get to that I get to be with my kids and my family and experience life, and and so life is good. Yeah, the Stoics say we learn the most during hardship and suffering. Well, how long did your suffering last? How long did it take to get out of that dark place? Um, well, really, you know, the thing about it is, <laughs> when you hit rock bottom, you have two choices, and and uh and really those choices are either to check out or to change and uh i'm not you know i, I would never do that to my kids um and so at that point it's like well i can't continue to live like this um and so that's where you're forced to make that decision and so you know by the end of 2017 going to 2018 i made that decision i'm like no you know what i'm staying here as long as i can and I don't have control over it. So why worry about it? You know, there's no sense worrying about it. If you don't have control over it, uh, enjoy. And, uh, you, you know, I'm the kind that if I jumped out of the plane and, and I realized halfway down the parachute's not opening, I'm going to spread my arms and I'm going to yell and have fun and I'm going to enjoy every last second till I hit the ground. So uh, that's where I hit 2018 is you hit that dark spot and it's like, you know what? I'm opening my arms up and I'm going to scream and enjoy the exhilarating ride until it ends. So after 2018, these strange things that were happening to you, did they end? Oh, no. <laughs> what, no. what was the next thing that happened? Oh, well, um, to be honest with you, there's so many. I will tell you, my biggest regret was, is that it really wasn't till the start of the show, which, you know, we didn't film season one until 2019. So we, we didn't even know that we were doing a show until the end of 2018. And by that point, I'd been all of, on all of 2016, all of 2017, and most of 2018 before we uh, had determined that we were going to do a show. And so we'd start talking about it in July. I think it was like July of 2018 was when it really looked like, hey, this might actually happen. They didn't green light it until like, if I remember right, around December of 2018. And... Uh, and then one of the producers that was responsible for even getting the show into existence, his name was TJ Allard, uh, a good friend of mine, somebody I'm still, I have a lot of respect for, but TJ pulled me aside at the very beginning. So this is like, we'll call it like August or September ish of 2018. He pulled me aside and he's like, keep a good journal of all of this. Cause someday you'll be happy that you have it. 
And you would think it's obvious, but you got to realize, like, I didn't come from the paranormal community, the UFO community. I'm not used to documenting crazy things. Matter of fact, I'm used to explaining them away so people won't think I'm crazy. And so um, I didn't keep a good journal or good record. And thank goodness a lot of my experiences took place on, uh, you know, I've got texts and emails and photographs of pictures where I can go back and say, oh, okay, that's right. This happened, this happened. And the TV series has done a lot to help document like uh, 1% of the things that are happening out here. Um, to answer your question, you know, uh, we, we had uh, our very first camera system that we put out here. Brandon was skeptical of of this place being that strange. Uh, he, he was a skeptic. Of course, Eric Bard, uh, he has a, a saying that he always tells us he's, you know, he says, I'm not here to believe. I'm not here to disbelieve. I'm here to observe. So he really, and he's very disciplined and just really sticking to that and not, you know, not letting a bias try to, he just wants to follow the data wherever it leads him. And, um, and so that being said, uh, while Brandon, Brandon has considerable financial resources, it wasn't just an open checkbook. Let's just go hog wild there. You know, it was like, let's start with a little bit. If we see something, we'll, we'll do more. We're going to follow the data. So our first security system was really just, it was a, it was a $500 Costco surveillance system, you know, eight, eight security cameras. And, uh, I, we set it up and when we set it up, um, we used the existing wires from the Bigelow days. Uh, he had cameras mounted out in the field. We, I just took those cameras out of the, they had, they were mounted inside a protective shroud that, that kept them out of the elements. And I just taken his cameras out, put our cameras inside of it. So to look at it, it didn't look like anything on the landscape had changed. And, and Eric's Eric really stressed upon like, Let's observe first, because once you make a change, you can never go back, right? And so let's observe it as it is and see what, what we see. So put this first camera system in. It's a cheap system, but it, you know, it's uh, compared to the cameras that Bigelow had, just because of the advances of technology, uh, those cameras were far superior to anything Bigelow had out here. So it was still, even though they were cheap by our standards, by, you know, the cameras you could get in the year... In, in 1996, they're still a lot better than that. Um, almost immediately, we start having strange things happening to these cameras. Uh, they're going offline, coming back online. Uh, and it wasn't just the fact that they're going offline, coming back online. The timing of this was so interesting as well. A lot of times we say out here on the ranch, it's not what happens, it's when it happens. Um, there's things that happen all the time that by themselves they are like, so that's not a big deal. But then when you correlate it with the timing of everything else that's happening, you're like, that's an awfully big co coincidence. Right. So, uh, at one point, like I said, this wasn't my full-time job. I, I was out here as much as I could be, but Eric had notified me that, that, um, some, some of the cameras had taken, had gone offline. And uh, we had it set up to where he was able to remotely log into him and watch him from his uh, office there in Lehigh. And, um, and so I told him, I said, you know, when I get a second, I'll, uh, I'll run out there and I'll check on him. And, and days went by, I don't, you know, I don't know, three, four, five, six days go by. I hadn't, I hadn't made, it wasn't a huge priority at the time. And, uh, and then, uh, after a few days had gone by, I got a I got a message from him. It was on a group feed with Brandon. Brandon was on it. Eric was on it. Myself and and Eric had uh, in this text. Eric expressed some concern that based on the behavior he was seeing, it was suggestive that somebody had logged into the system and was hacking it. You know, had hacked into the system and was was issuing commands. And so. Um, he, he was, because of his concern about this, I'm like, all right, I'll go out there right now. And he said, you know, he instructed me to take a hard drive with me and to download the log files so we could see if in fact somebody had been toying with us and, uh, you know, it wasn't something, it was someone that was, 
that was playing with these cameras, turning them on and off. And so I leave, it's pretty late. And because it was late, my wife said, I'll go out there with you. And I don't remember it. I mean, it was 1030, maybe it was midnight, but it was pitch black. And we rolled up to the gate here at the ranch. And I'll tell you, I'm not scared of the dark. I actually really enjoy the dark. I'm a person that enjoys their solitude and the dark seems to enhance that solitude. <laughs> so I appreciate the dark. I like it. I'm comfortable in it. And I've spent a lot by, you know, by this point, I've spent a lot of hours out on the ranch um, at, at all hours of the day. I spend, uh, you know, I'll be out here irrigating at two, three in the morning uh, out there in pitch black uh, by myself, tending the water. So I'm very comfortable. And, and I tell people nine out of 10 days, this ranch is so peaceful and serene and calm, you know, but that one out of 10, you show up and it's hell on earth. And we rolled up to the gate this night. And as we rolled up and we're waiting for the gate to open, like the hair just starts rising up on both, you know, like you could feel the evil. And my wife and I are both like, oh, it doesn't feel good out here tonight. And if it wasn't for the fact of the urgency that we needed to see if someone was toying our system, I just turned around and gone home. But we, but we proceeded in and uh, we pull in and because it feels so horrible, uh, I told my wife, I'm just leaving the car running in case we have to get out of here quick. <clears throat> and so uh, we come in and this is before we had remodeled the command center to what it is today. At that point, it was just an old rat infested, dumpy modular home. And we walk into the front door and we just shut the door when all of a sudden, <clears throat> excuse me, we hear what sounds like footprints run or footsteps running across the room. So you come in the front door and there's a wall to your right and separating the living room for the master bedroom. We call it Bigelow's bedroom because it's where he would stay when he came out. And so it's a master suite. There's a, there's a walk-in closet. And then of course a bathroom as part of it. And uh, it sounded like somebody had run across the bedroom into the bathroom. And uh, I had my handgun, so I pulled my gun out and uh, I go in there and I look under the bed and behind the dresser, everywhere in the bedroom, nobody's in there. I go in the closet and I'm certain, like we were, what we heard was so real. I'm certain there's somebody in this, in this place. And we'd already, we were already thinking somebody was like messing with our computer system. So in my mind, I'm catching them red handed. <laughs> check the closet the closet's clear i go in the bathroom and at that point there's this old tub that's sitting along the wall and the, the shower curtain had been drawn across it and i'm like oh whoever's in here is hiding behind that shower curtain and so i literally was holding my gun with both hands and i used my foot to kick the shower curtain home open thinking somebody's gonna die tonight and kick it open and there's nobody there. The, the room is empty. And so I'm like, both my wife, I mean, my wife had jumped, she like, when we heard the footprints, she, or the footsteps, she's like, Tom, someone's in here. And she spoke that out audibly. And so we both heard it and uh, like, okay. So we go over sit down at the little NVR or DVR I plug in the, the hard drive. Eric's, you know, there's this texting feed that's going on between Eric and Brandon and I, and Eric's giving me instructions and I'm, I'm watching this little uh, upload bar just slowly start ticking up. And I'm sitting on the left, my wife's sitting on the right, we're facing the computer screen, went off to my left, which is on the opposite side of the trailer down on the south side. All of a sudden I hear this loud slapping noise in the bedroom. It was as if somebody had electrical cord and was in there slamming it against the wall multiple times. I jumped up. I ran back there. I go in the room. There's nobody there. Now, I can tell you, this is a calm night. The wind wasn't blowing. And at this point, I had enough. I'd logged enough hours in this place. I know what the creaky water heater sounds like. I know what the furnace contracting and expanding sound like. like I was familiar with the sounds of the trailer. This defied all of them, and it was repeated. It was just slam, 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 slam. 
So now I come back and I, not only is, can I not find the, like what caused the sound, there's not even anything in that room that could imitate that sound if I wanted to. It's not like there was a cord sitting on the ground. So now I come back, sit at the chair. Both my wife and I are both like really on edge. And I'm watching this stupid upload bar, this progress bar on this download, just taking forever. And we're sitting there. And all of a sudden, it sounded like someone standing right between my wife and I leaned over and said, you need to leave now. And we looked at each other. It's like, did you hear that? And I reached forward to the mouse to, to go and eject this hard drive. And we heard the voice a second time. And it said, you need to leave now. And at that point, I'm like, screw the hard drive. We're out of here. We jumped up. We ran for the door. We run out, you know, lock the door, run out, get in the car that's still running. We burn out. And one interesting little side note to this, talking about timing of things, is that camera that had been down for several days, uh, one of the cameras that was down was the one face, it was out in the field facing back towards the command center. That camera that had been off for a couple of days, literally the second we pull up to the trailer, that camera came back on. So, you know, by itself, it's like, oh, yeah, the camera came back up. So what? But the fact that it like it was exactly when we pulled up that that camera turns itself back on. Um, the timing, the timing was wow. driving crazy out here. So we're in the car. I peel out of here. We're racing down the half mile dirt road towards the, the gate. And I'm trying to text Eric and Brandon to let them know what the heck just happened. My phone won't respond. So I throw it to my wife. I threw my phone to my wife and I'm like, text them and tell them what that, what just happened. And she's trying to text. She's like, Tom, your phone won't respond. And I'm like, just like push the side button, reset it, turn it on. She's like, it, nothing will work. And I'm getting irritated. And she's like, fine at the gate, uh, you drive or I'll drive and you text them. So we get down to the gate and while we're like, you know, we're waiting for the gate to open. I, we jump out, we trade places. She's now driving and my phone is so bricked, it won't even do a hard reboot. I mean, I'm holding the power button in, trying to get the stupid thing to even just turn off. And it will not respond to anything. It is just completely bricked. It's still on the screen with the text messaging. And uh, we, we leave. We, it was, uh, we, when we got about, I don't know, a short distance from the Ute Plaza grocery store in Fort Duchesne, which is almost back to Highway 40, uh, the phone just started responding again, and I was able to send a text out and, and tell them what had just occurred. And I think, if I remember right, it was like 12, 13 minutes in between that window of when the phone wouldn't respond. So, uh, I, I mean, I could I could go on with incidents. I There was a time I was up working on a camera. We call it the Eagle's Nest. It's up on top of the Mesa. Um, I've got a extension ladder because it was up on top of the tower and I, I'm up on the ladder. Our ranch dog, William is right at the bottom of the tower. He just kind of laying down there. He's a very mellow, quiet dog for the most part. And, um, and Eric is, I'm texting with Eric once again, and he's, we're trying to troubleshoot this stupid camera. And, and so I'm at the camera itself and he's texting me, you know, try this, do this. And, uh, and I'm texting him back, you know, are you seeing anything yet? Is, is it working? And all of a sudden, William starts to whine. And, and that's unusual because William doesn't just whine for no reason. He starts whining. I look down and he starts whining. And all of a sudden, my phone starts going berserk. I lose control of it. It starts opening and closing apps. I'm not touching the screen. It's just like opening. I keep punching the... And I've, I, I've actually got a screen recording of this because I was able to flip my thing. Uh, I've got an Android. I was able to flip the, the top uh, scroll bar down and hit the screen recording. So I've actually got a recording of this exact incident happening. But uh, the, the messaging app just kept closing out, closing out, and other apps are opening up. I can't control my phone. <laughs> there happened to be another person uh, on the ranch uh, with me at that point. I, and they were down looking down through the rocks just below. And I yelled down to him, said, Hey, I need to go down to the command center. I can't talk to Eric. Like my phone's misbehaving. 
Well, when we'd come up to the tower, we'd left a bag at the bottom, had a bunch of stuff in it. Um, and one of those things that was in it was a headlamp. It was one of those little LED headlamps that you put on the van. And it, uh, the battery had died in it. And so it was just stuffed in the bag there. As we come down off the hill uh, and we get close to where that bag is laying down there by the rocks, uh, the bag is like glowing. It's just pulsating glowing. I'm like, what the heck's going on with that bag? Go over there, open the bag, pull out that dead, that dead battery LED headlamp is just like pulsating so bright. And uh, I mean, the light looked brighter than if we put a brand new battery in that. And, and it's <laughs> they're just kind of like, and so like, what the heck? So that's an incident where the dog started whining. My phone started going crazy. Again, you were asking about electromagnetic interference, you know, maybe the, maybe the culprit for this. And then this flashlight or this LED headlamp going from completely dead battery to just pulsating so brightly. So, and I could, I could spend hours just relating one experience after another of a similar nature. I've, I've just got one question left because we're nearly at the hour. And that is, do you think that these strange phenomena are related to extraterrestrial activity? Good question. Um, you know, people ask us all the time, is it interdimensional? Is it extraterrestrial? Is it, it, it you know, what do you guys think is out there? And a lot of times we just say D, it's all of the above. Um, you know, I don't think that we found any one answer that could account for all of the strangeness that we've seen. So uh, we start coming to, we start, and I say we, um, I'm, I'm not a scientist. You know, I, I really take my cues from the smart guys in the room that have spent their lives uh, studying this discipline. But, uh, you know, there'll be, there'll be uh, ideas thrown out there and, start, you know, I will start subscribing to those thinking, okay, yeah, that could explain it. And then we'll have an event occur where it's like, well, that wouldn't cause that. And it's almost, you know, not back to square one, but um, we haven't found like one answer that would account for everything that we've seen. So it has to be, uh, I don't know, but I will say that there does seem to be an intelligence behind it. Um, I don't know anybody that spent a lot of time out here on the ranch that hasn't left firmly believing that whatever it is out here on the ranch, yeah, there's an intelligence behind it. It's because so much of the stuff seems to be very specific and targeted towards individuals. All right. For a second, then let's, let's forget the experts, the scientists, the academics. You strike me as a man who is finally attuned to the lay of the land what does your gut tell you is behind this phenomenon? Um, based on the things that I've personally witnessed, uh, things for which we don't know of a technology that exists that could do some of those, uh, hacking in a closed telescope system, removing things off the menu, um, having some of our electronics, like based on the things that I've witnessed, I it just seem, I'm convinced that there is an intelligence. What that is, I'll be honest with you. I go back and forth. I, one day I believe one thing and the next I believe another. And it's based because like I said, of the, the, the things that are happening, but I do believe that there's some, there's an intelligence and uh, something that's very, you know, uh, technologically advanced. Now, if that is that, is that something that's in the Mesa, you know, is there an ancient piece of technology that's in the Mesa that's causing this? Is there something underground that's causing it? Something in the sky that I don't know, but there, I, I feel like there's something very technologically advanced, intelligent, why that's got intelligence uh, that, that um, is behind at least some of it. Thomas, you're absolutely fascinating. These stories are so gripping and engaging. I really appreciate you spending time. 
Can you tell the viewers where they can find you and support you online? Yeah. Um, so we have a, for the, those that are interested in what's going on here at Skinwalker Ranch, we have a, a website, skinwalker-ranch.com, I believe. Uh, we have an insider program, which allows people to even, we've got a live stream, some of our cameras that um, Eric will, will pick, you know, different cameras, different views to share, but those live streams are up usually 24 seven, unless something crazy is happening that takes them down. But um, yeah, they can go to skinwalker-ranch.com and check it out and, and follow some of the exciting things that are happening out here at Skinwalker Ranch. All right. You have a great rest of your day at Skinwalker Ranch, Thomas. Thank you for joining us. Cheers. Thanks for having me on. Bye-bye.